In these perilous times, see from current events how biblical prophecy is coming to pass in front of our eyes. You're watching In the Last Days, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. With Martin and Natalie Blackham, thank you to our friends and partners who make this program possible. Now, here's Martin and Natalie. Hi, welcome to the In the Last Days television program with myself, Martin Blackham. Natalie's behind the scenes today, but she says hello to you. We're so excited because uh, if you were watching last week, you'll remember that we had Rabbi Ari Abramovitz on. So great to have you with us again. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you know, we, we so much enjoyed talking with you last week on the show, and uh, it was so interesting. And uh, I know that you will have loved, just loved the program. Um, I just wanted to say right at the beginning, we, they can go to a website. You've got the Land of Israel website. Landofisrael.com. Also iTunes. We, we put our, I, our podcast, and we, we didn't want to just have it on a Jewish platform for the whole world. And thank God it's really risen to the top. We're number one on iTunes right now in the Jewish category. It's called Israel Inspired Podcast. So we're really, really enjoying that right now. That's been a source of tremendous happiness for me. So uh, people are welcome to come and listen to us there as well. One of the articles you did and you, uh, and you mentioned when uh, we were talking before the program was about the Philippines. And uh, many of you may uh, will be well aware of the terrible tragedy and uh, the disaster that happened in the Philippines. So tell us a bit about this article. It's funny. I often think about my promotional efforts for the work. Like if I write an article, I'm going to promote it. And that promotion is directly correlated to its success. And I saw that that's just not true because I was in Berlin. I, w I had just taken a trip. I was on the tail end of a trip. I started in, the, in Taiwan, Singapore, Philippines, Hong Kong. Then I went to Europe, and I was in Germany, Switzerland, Sweden, France, Finland, Norway. And I was in Germany, and I saw what just happened in the Philippines. And I'd been there four times over the last six months. And I was devastated because, you know, every nation I go to has their own almost character, has their own personality as a nation. For example, I was in Finland. And I made a joke, and this joke usually lands, right? People laugh at it. And it was like sort of quiet in there. There were some laughs. And afterwards I went and I was like, did they not like me? He's like, no, I never saw a response. They were hysterical. I'm like, they were hysterical? They didn't seem hysterical. He's like, you have to understand, in Finland, we're sort of introverted. Uh, someone, who, a shy person in Finland looks at their feet when they're talking to you. An extrovert looks at your feet. You know, that's, that's what he said. Like, so in, in the Philippines, they were unique people in that they weren't as financially well off as a lot of the other countries I was in in the Far East that were quite affluent countries. But they were so happy and they were so welcoming and so full of joy and it was this stark contrast. So I just wanted to write an article about why I value them so much. That here in Israel we have a lot of people from the Philippines that come and fulfill our commandment of honor your father and mother. And they're taking care of our parents in a way full of compassion and of kindness and of love and just to show them some gratitude for who they are. My grandfather always said, you're not judged by how many servants you have, but by how many people you serve. And that was my message of the article. If the gauge of, of judgment is how many people you serve, then this is a very holy people. And it was just, I just put it up, and I thought it would just bury it. And it became the, uh, nearly the number two most popular viewed article in the history of the paper. And they said it went super viral in the Philippines. And when I looked at the comments, I said, I just felt so filled with that sort of I can die now feeling. Not that I want to die, God forbid, but like, ah, uh, that is like just the love they're saying, wow, I, I thank you for seeing that in us. And somehow I feel like right now, as the Jewish, there's so much darkness in the world. It's not our job to fight it. I don't want to fight any darkness. I want to spread a lot of light. And then the darkness just goes away. The darkness is ultimately an illusion. I don't believe it's really there. And if we just do our job of seeing the good qualities in every nation and every people and in ourselves, we connect with our own identity. That's ultimately what I think the, the mission is here right now. Because I wake up in the morning, I'm like, what it really needs to be. It's so easy for us to get lost in our little lives. It happens to me all the time. Well, how am I going to make a living? And how? But if we just wake up and say, what needs to be done in the world? What do the Jewish people need to do? And we try to do that. I feel like God takes care of the other stuff somehow. I think that's one of the things of life, isn't it? That <coughs> it's difficult to see the big picture. Now, very often we're so engaged in what we're doing 
that we don't see we don't see everything else that's happening at the same time and um, no, this is one of the reasons f for the program and the reason you know for our viewers is that we can you know a lot of them are very involved in life and then but they really love Israel they really want to stand with Israel and this is a way through the program that we can show them that we can go into their homes you know where you are and uh, we can show them what's happening in Israel we can bring them people and I think that shows them the bigger picture and especially there's a lot of our viewers who are Israel advocates in other words that they're writing to their member of parliament or they're you know standing up in <coughs> in newspapers or whatever uh, standing up for Israel and uh, or on marches in London there's been marches for Israel to stand with the nation of Israel and a lot of you uh, are advocates and uh, this helps them because it you know to give them the full picture because unfortunately the media has been very biased you know the, the the news coming out of Israel from the mainstream media has not shown the full picture so we hope that in some ways this will you know give them a uh, an other another window another avenue into Israel and like your Tuesday I think this is the secret without <laughs> being presumptuous to your prog the program you know the Tuesday night live was from Jerusalem Israel so exciting because it's live it's from Israel and we you know we can feel part of it and I think that people want to be a part of it they want to feel part of what's happening uh, in Israel I remember one lady she received a letter from us and she said I just cried seeing the stamp from Israel I thought how can you cry looking at a stamp it's just it's just a stamp from Israel it's nothing ex exciting or you know it's just a normal stamp but she cried because it was for her, she wanted to connect. See, for, but those are holy tears. I don't, sometimes I feel like I struggle with the whole free will issue. What is my free will? Do I really decide what I do? I'm starting to believe not really. That God sets me up in these situations where he knows what my decision will be. My decision only comes down to how am I going to experience this journey that I'm on in this world. It's like you and I are on a bus on the way from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Now, I could be sitting there and say, is the driver going in the right direction? Is he going to fall off the side of the road? Is he going to get there? Is he going to get lost? And, or I could, and while you're sitting next to me looking out the window and enjoying the journey, we're going to get to the same destination. But did we have faith in the driver that he was in charge of the big things and we're going to enjoy this journey? And sometimes when I travel out of Israel, I feel like it's not my decision to go. Yeah, maybe I booked the ticket, but God really set me up there. I'm meant to be traveling throughout the world and feeling the yearning and the longing for Jerusalem. And that longing and yearning is a holy feeling too. And it makes you appreciate it more. So in some ways I think this woman is more in, the woman that cried over the stamp is more in Jerusalem than sometimes I have been when I'm in Jerusalem and I'm not appreciating it like that. So, you know, where your heart is is really where you are. So that woman is in Jerusalem and it's a holy thing and that's why you're doing important work here also. Thank you. And I think that sometimes we can take things for granted or because just because of the pressures of life that, you know, just, you know, the one of the things and we talked last on the last program and you may have seen uh, last week, we talked about the Aliyah, the importance of the Western Aliyah, the American Aliyah, which hasn't really been, or the Anglo and the Aliyah hasn't really been um, so much promoted, but is so, so vital in these days. Um, and one of the, the things is, is that as the people are coming back, it's getting us excited. You were standing in the, for the parliament and the Anglos were coming. With Dov Lipman, the Anglos were going. You know, there's been this excitement that things are happening. I mean, there was an organization, I don't know if you've come across them, called Hadar Israel, which is uh, for the Anglo-speaking Israelis. And there's this excitement from the Anglos to, to be back in the land. And yet, there are so, still so many of them in, in America and what do you what how how will they come here this is the the big question i know a lot of you will be very interested in this but you know even in the uk uh we have a, a a large jewish community particularly in the london and manchester area but how because they're so uh part of the community and it's so difficult for them to uproot and how, how are they going to move it's <laughs> <laughs> that that's a tricky one you threw some curveballs at me but that's a good one um you know, we, when we were doing our campaign, part of signing up for the party to support us was you had to put your, your it was a Hebrew application, so a lot of them needed help. We had people at every meeting that would help them fill out the application. You had to put your father's name in Hebrew. And as someone came up to me and said, 
I haven't had to say what my father's Hebrew name is since I was called up to the Torah at my bar mitzvah. And now I need to do it to be in a political party in Israel? And like that sort of miraculous vision, when I decided to stay here, what was it? I was looking at a can of Coca-Cola. And I realized that my whole life Hebrew was this old antiquated Latin language. And now it's on, the, it's on a can of Coca-Cola. And little children I'm hearing are playing in the playground speaking the same words as Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah. That God has breathed life into us. And now this is where it is. This is where it's at. And the Jews of America simply are so disconnected from themselves. From the, that's what's happening there. We've been in exile for 2,000 years. And it's one thing to take the Jew out of exile. It's another thing to take the exile out of the Jew. And I know every day I'm getting a little bit more pulled out of exile, but a lot of me is still there too. And even the, the I'll, I'll get to your question, but I remember on our television show, there was one interview that I think I think back to more and more than any other. We wanted to go to peace now. You know peace now, they're like, I feel like they sort of hijacked the word peace, but they're a radical, extreme leftist group that wants to have no Israel, pretty much. They want to give all of Israel to the Arabs. And, and we wanted to get them to say something positive about the settlers, about the Jews in Hebron. We weren't able to get them to say anything, but one question I asked them was haunting me. I asked them, do we need more Jewish unity? Unity is liberal and fluffy. Who's not going to want unity, right? Every one of them said no. No, 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 no. I said, why? Why didn't? And I realized, what is it that really is bothering? What motivates them? That they do, Jewish unity means we as the Jewish people are united together, and we're different in some way than those that are not Jewish. They don't hate the Jews of Hebron. They don't hate the settlers. They hate the Jew within themselves because they don't know who they are. If they understood that this desire that they have to perfect the world and have this global, harmonious, village of all of humanity loving each other and the way to do that is for us to be good Jews they would be the they would be the ultra ortho ultra orthodox and that's what it's coming to so I feel like our message in America and I'm sorry I'm going on like this so much but when I'm traveling and I just spoke to 8,000 Christians in Hungary for me to speak to 80 Jews in America is a lot more terrifying than that because the Christians that I spoke to in Hungary are such wonderful, loving people that are thirsty to connect and to learn. The Jews of America, I think in some ways they don't really want to hear the message that I'm sharing, which is that Israel is our home. Israel is where we belong. If we want to live fulfilled, meaningful lives as Jews, this is where it is. Unfortunately, you know, it says, <laughs> the actions of the fathers are a sign for the children. And we know that the exodus from, that the final exodus will be similar to the one from Egypt. And in Egypt, 80% of the Jews stayed behind. They died in Egypt. They didn't make it out. Now, I certainly hope and pray that that's not the case in America. But I do think that we're headed for very volatile, turbulent, unpredictable, and dangerous times, particularly for American Jews. And that's why the times we're in are of such high importance. Because going back to Egypt, what, did, what were we asked to do? We were asked to slaughter the lamb. I know you have one understanding of the lamb. I respect it. M a, a Jew's understanding, my understanding of it is the lamb, we know historically, biblically, was the god of the Egyptians. They worshipped that lamb. And we were asked to slaughter the lamb, take its blood and put it on our doorpost, and then skewer it and roast it outside our homes. The god of the Egyptians, meaning the Egyptians, 2000, for, for hundreds of years they've been our slave masters. And now we're going to take their God, put its blood on our doorpost. And that means that if this redemption didn't come, every single Jew that did that would have been tortured and killed. That a time comes in history where you have to cast your lot one way or the other. We're going to have fear in this life. Is it going to be fear of God or fear of man? That's where we're at in history right now. And that's, I think, what needs to be presented to Christians around the world, Jews around the world. We need to decide, do we fear God or fear man? And uh, the, 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 the Aliyah really is a key, isn't it? Because as the Jewish people come back to the land of Israel, we're seeing uh, amazing things happen, the desert bloom, uh, technology. Uh, many of you will be aware, uh, the viewers will be aware of the, tech, the <coughs> fantastic technology that's coming out of Israel because the Jewish people are coming back and resettling the land in accordance with the Bible. But one of the sad things has been about the division of the land. It, it seems to be this, we seem to be this kind of pull-push thing with this thing. And um, I know it's one of the things that you've really been fighting for. 
And I, I think that whilst we, we do talk about it a lot on the program, I think it needs re-emphasizing, and we have to keep saying it because there's this mindset about the West Bank. There's this, like, this politicism, uh, this, this, wrong, this wrong understanding about what it is, and it is Samaria and Judea. It is the traditional home of the Jewish people, and it's been inhabited by the Jewish people. And um, is that something that you will be, and hopefully you might be doing it on the Tuesday Night Live show, that talking about the importance of the historic Israel, which is, I mean, people don't even realize this, that Jerusalem is under in threat, which is historic Israel. Hebron, which is uh, in the Bible, um, Shiloh, which is in the, in the north, all these, these Bible towns, and yet we have uh, the pressure through Kerry and through other people to, to divide the land. Where do I start <laughs> on this? So I would say, you know, Islam means submission. And a fundamental tenet of Islam is global domination. Th that's what jihad means. It's the global war to take over the world. Now, Jews have lived better under Islam than under Christianity throughout history. But that's only when we're under Islam. When we are, you guys win, you're the leaders, we're under you, then they treat us better than Christians did. However, now that we have returned to the land of Israel and we have conquered the Islamic world is expanding and expanding. They have 23 Arab states, 57 Muslim states, they're expanding. And then this beaten, worn, nearly wiped out nation of Jews has come back to our land and conquered them. It doesn't matter whether we're one city block in Tel Aviv, right? It's, a, it's the existence of Israel in any capacity means that Islam is not the ultimate religion and Allah is not the ultimate God. That's why this is a religious war and it's a spiritual war. Think about it, in 1964, the PLO was established, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Were they established in 1964 to liberate the settlements of 1967? We didn't even have the West Bank. This whole idea that this is about the West Bank has nothing to do with the West Bank. It has to do with us existing in any capacity. Now, the way I see it now, as I'm here more and more and experiencing this journey of life in Israel, I would say Ahmadinejad and Holocaust denial. Seem to be different issues, but it's the same thing. When he put these conferences together, millions of dollars into them, well, Netanyahu was in the, uh, in the UN saying it happened, and look at this picture, and look at this map, and, and look at this museum, and we're sh everyone's saying it happened, it happened. But why isn't anyone asking why? Why does he care to deny it? What does he get out of it? So it happened or it didn't happen. Now, I believe that everything that happens in the world is orchestrated by God for us, to give us an opportunity to come close to him. So why would he have, well, the first place that any Jewish diplomat brings a foreign politician when they come to Israel, where is it? The, the uh, Holocaust Museum. Exactly. Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum. And the subliminal message there is that part of a reason we have a right to this land is because the Holocaust happened. So if, if that's true, if that's the reason that we believe in any capacity that we have a right to Israel is the Holocaust, Museum, well, it didn't happen then. And even if it did happen, what, the Palestinians, they did it? Why should they have to suffer because of your Holocaust? Well, then they say, well, United Nations resolution, that's why we have a right to be here. Well, then they would say, let's take another vote in the UN. If you're going to give them the power that you're giving them the credit for you existing, well, then they can take it away. And all of these other League of Nations, whatever it is, but then, in the end of the time, what is our real right to be here? That's what this is all about. And it says in the first verse of the Torah, Bereshit bara, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And our greatest commentator says, why is it that the Bible starts with this verse and not the first commandment? He says, the reason is because in the end of days the nations will come against Israel and say the land does not belong to you. And you are to respond and say, the land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people because the God of Israel gave it to us. And that's what my vision is. I want to have a leader out of this country that stands in the United Nations and says the right of the Jewish people to the land of Israel is because God gave it to us. And then when the secular European parliamentarians say, you can't mix politics and religion, you can't say that, we don't believe in God, well then let's say, let us now teach you about God. That's what this is all about. It's all for us to be who we need to be. And if we would just do that and in some ways, I know this could be misconstrued and misunderstood, I think a lot of the anti-Semitism in the world is a subconscious resentment against the Jewish people for not being who we need to be to the world. And if we are simply just being ourselves, not reactive and not scared, but giving love and giving guidance and giving teaching and welcoming, 
then a lot of that would simply dissipate and go away. Yeah, I've heard, <coughs> I heard someone talking about this, that uh, they, in their opinion, they were saying that because the Jewish people weren't fulfilling their destiny of being like the radio show you had, of being a light to the nations, instructing the, na in fact, teaching the nations, instructing the nations with Torah, because they weren't fulfilling that, that it was like anti-Semitism was push, was one of the um, provocateurs, to use an expression, that to make them to say, come on, you know, why aren't you, why, I, I don't know, this was just somebody, somebody's opinion, if it's true, but I mean, it's just an interesting So an as, interesting as Jews, you know, we have sort of a different, we, I believe that as Christian Jews, we have the same roots, and that's what really brings us together, but we have different understandings of things, and that's okay, you know, that's a good thing. But as a Jew, we believe God is ein od mil vado, as it says in Deuteronomy. God is everywhere. And how is one close to God or far from God if God is everywhere? Well, in the spiritual world, you're close to something when you're similar to it. And you're far from something when you're different from it. And God has certain attributes of kindness and compassion and mercy and sometimes strength and restraint. There's a balance of attributes that God has. And when we're able to live those attributes then God uses us as a vessel and a vehicle for his light in the world. So it says in the Talmud that Haman's seal, that Haman was able to do what 70 prophets were not. Right? Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, they all say, repent, we're, repent, um, repent. And we're, and we're talking, uh, for the viewers who may not know who Haman is, oh, is uh, that's very okay. Good, very good. Uh, the Haman was the um, person who was trying to cause a holocaust for the Jewish people in the book of, you can read this in the book of Esther, and was uh, part of the royal uh, Interesting. governing government. He was, he was in government, from Persia, which is right. modern day yeah, Iran. Iran. I'll leave that there. <laughs> um, but uh, he's, all of these prophets said to the Jewish people, repent, return your hearts to God. I'm sorry, I'm busy, I'm washing my cat, I don't have time, we're later. And then Haman says, you will all be wiped out on this day, and the king uh, affirmed it. And that actually led to the Jewish people repenting and returning to Israel and building the temple. Did Haman think that he was, when he was trying, he was legitimately, sincerely, authentically trying to have genocide against the Jewish people, did he know that it was through him that God would actually bring us to repent and build the temple? We're all part of God's plan. Everyone, the good guys, the bad guys, everyone. The only question is, do we want to be a vessel for it or have God use us and have it sort of reflect off of us like Haman? So when I see you're here in Israel, you're saying, I want to be a vehicle for this. I want to step up to the plate and, and be a part of this thing. And you really are. I mean, a lot of times we could focus on what divides us, but that would just be so silly. Because for me, when I look at the way I understood God 10 years ago, I think half of it was wrong. So clearly as a Jew, I think that a lot of the way you understand God is wrong, right? But I see that half of the way I understood God was wrong 10 years ago. So I hope that I grow enough that 10 years from now I see half of the way I understand God is wrong. God is bigger than us, but it's really our intention. Is our intention to seek truth and come close to God? And if so, then we're on the same journey. We're on the same mission towards the same God. We just have different understandings of it, and that shouldn't, it shouldn't separate us from each other. It should bring us closer together. And do you think it's um, funny because you, 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 you've been speaking to Christian audiences as well as Jewish audiences? Uh, how do you find them when, when you, you know, you're coming there as a, as a rabbi from Israel, you're coming there uh, as a Jewish person. How do you find the Christian audiences? From what perspective? How do, they, how do I think well they, they perceive they, me? Yeah. How do I perceive them? Do they, how do you find them? Uh, so I, I find them very appreciative, very warm, some of them not as much. Some of them, uh, you know, sort of converge upon me and feel like they need to convert me to Christianity. And now I used to be upset. It's not a pleasant thing for me. But, uh, and I also don't want to engage in debates. My job is not to slice and dice Christianity. That's not what I'm there for. So I just try to steer clear of those fights. But if they're going to try to convert me, the way I understand their missionary activities to me is they're trying to express love to me. They're trying to, and that's their way of showing love. But for me, I feel like I'm in this world to change me. I want to come close to God and change me, and not to go changing everyone to conform to what I think that they need to be. So I will sometimes, you know, fight back a little bit. Not fight back, but give them a just a little dose of like, 
why I'm not that. Because I, I'm very cautious about it because I don't want to change them. My job is not to change anyone. My job is to give love and to give inspiration and to be there if they have questions or want something good. And I think if we're all just trying to change us, because I, uh, what I try to do when I meet Christian groups is say, what can I learn from them here? And I know that I've benefited tremendously. For example, when I make a prayer over water before I drink water, I used to just say the Hebrew words. But as I travel in these Christian communities, I see the way they pray before they eat. And they're very present. They, they talk about who they're with. And it's a very real-time thing. And I think that that's what Judaism really used to be before we were exiled and we lost and we just sort of got lost only in the liturgy. And the liturgy is very important, but that's sort of real. So it's almost that we gave it to Christianity, right, because you believe your root is. And now they're giving it back to us. And that's a beautiful thing. So I'm not threatened by that. I think that there's a lot of beauty and a lot of things to learn. And I've integrated that more and more. Into, but now I say it with the liturgy also, because the liturgy is an important thing for us as Jewish it people. It kind of keeps you, the liturgy kind of keeps you focused. If you had nothing... Uh, then we're sort of drifting. You, I mean, yeah. ha, we've been so long since we've had a temple, we don't even know to want it. We don't even know why to want it. We're so lost, and we're such an orphan generation, that the liturgy helps us... Re oh, I want the temple. I want the Messiah to come. I want Jerusalem. I want these things. And it helps make God's will into our will and then our will into God's will. And it's that sort of beautiful relationship. Thank you so much for coming in today. I Thank think you. that a lot of people will have you know, really been blessed and really been instructed uh, about what's happening. And so I thank you so much for taking your time to Thank come you. across. Thank you for what you're doing here. And uh, if you'd uh, like to contact us by email, don't forget you can reach us at info at in the last days dot com. Uh, visit the website www.inthelastdays.com. And remember, we're living in the last days. You've been watching In the Last Days, a TV program with Martin and Natalie Blackham, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. If you would like to financially support the program or find out about conferences, meetings, or ministry products, then please contact us with the details on your screen. Visit our easy-to-use website at www.inthelastdays.com and register for our free e-newsletter. Get the latest news from Israel, product information, online video teaching, or watch today's TV program at a time that's convenient to you. Thank you again, friends and partners, for making this program possible. See you same time, same station for the next program from In the Last Days.